And with that, that brings us to our first presentation for the day. And I'm really, really, really excited for this. So, uh, Vitsa, um, I've been looking to this, looking forward to this presentation since we initially dropped uh, emails a couple of weeks ago. So I'm super excited for this. Um, the floor is yours and uh, good luck. And we are looking forward to, to hearing what you have to say. So with no further ado, over to Vitsa. Outstanding. Thank, thank you so much. Yeah, so today we'll be talking about command line obfuscation. Uh, Jason already gave a, a nice little intro there. So if you're familiar with the concept, then I suppose this might have been a more appropriate title card. So uh, today in the, in the next, well, 35 minutes or so, I will be presenting uh, on this topic and some research I've done over the last couple of months. Uh, I found some really interesting, cool things that I'd like to share with you today. Uh, and uh, later today, I will be releasing some stuff as well, but more on that later. Um, so first things first, I will quickly introduce myself. So my name is Vitsa, in case you're wondering how it was pronounced. Um, I work for a PBC based in the UK here in London on a very warm summer day. Um, what I do for PDBC is helping clients with detection engineering, doing detection um, threat hunting, uh, but also uh, research. And in that capacity today, I'll be sharing some stuff on uh, command line obfuscation. Um, really looking forward to today. Uh, please do reach out in the Slack channel if you have any questions. Hopefully at the end we will have a couple of minutes to um, answer some of them live in this session, but I will be available throughout the day to, uh, to answer your questions and uh, also reach out on, on Twitter or GitHub, or if you're not on social media, uh, please send me in uh, an old-fashioned email. Cool, so um, let's crack on and, and start talking about the, uh, the interesting stuff. Command lines, how are command lines used? So, you are all a fairly technical audience, so I don't need to explain to you what a command line is. But I thought it would be good to take a step back and sort of like think about like why do we have them and why are they relevant? Um, so if you go back really to the early days of computing, right, like way before I was born, um, command lines, uh, command line inputs were the only ways in which you could interact with a, with a program, right? It's the only way to change the flow of a program. Um, we later got text inputs, and you know, nowadays, uh, non-technical users probably mainly use GUIs. But when you think about it, command lines are still everywhere, right? Even if you're not using them, even if you're using a GUI, in Windows, every process has a command line component. Uh, and under the hood, they're still very heavily relied on. And whether you are a threat hunter or you know, uh, in digital forensics, um, you will know that in every incident response job, you will also be looking at processes and command lines to understand what an attacker has done. So that's why for people like you and me, it's really important to, uh, to not forget about them. Um, before I start talking about the really interesting stuff and some of the cool findings, um, I thought this is a bit theoretical, but I thought it would be good to quickly go over sort of like the theory, because as, as usually I would say in computing, there are no standard uh, definitions or names for the various things. So to make sure we're all on the same page, I thought it would be good to uh, walk you quickly through a command line and sort of like give names to the individual parts. So um, what you see on the screen here is a uh, cert util command line, right? So cert util is a law bin that you can trick in this case into downloading a file. So this is something an attacker might use. Um, this whole thing as a whole is what we call the command line, right? So, so far, I'm so good. Um, you probably also know that these individual parts that we can separate by spaces is what we normally call command line arguments, right? So uh, each individual bit, and that includes the very start, right? This, the, the process itself is part of the command line and is therefore a command line argument. So far, still good. Um, as I was already saying here, cert util itself in this example is the program. Um, so it's an argument, but it's, it's, it's basically the program. And in this example, the next three ones are command line options. Why, why is this important? Well, um, they are different from the last two arguments, which, which, don't, which are not options. Um, and why do I know these are options? Well, it's because um, these things here, it looks like the arrow's got a bit crazy, but the forward slashes here is what we call option characters. So uh, by that, um, it indicates to the program that's reading the command line that um, this is passing an option that you'd like to change something about the control flow. Um, in the last two arguments here, they don't start with this forward slash. And for that reason, they are input to one of the other command line options. So if you even want to further uh, give them names, uh, those first two options we call switches because they can live on their own. Um, they can just live by themselves. But the last one is what we call a command line flag. The reason for that is that it requires input. 
right? So slash f on its own doesn't do anything. You always need two arguments after that. So in this case, a URL and then a file. So it's a bit, it's a bit dry, it's a bit theory, but because I will be referring to these terms, I thought it was still good that we're all on the same page, what I mean by these parts of the command line. Right. Um, compatibility, right? So now the problem statement. So why am I talking to you about command lines today? Um, what you probably can already tell from the previous slide and what I've been saying so far is that there is no standardization when it comes to command lines. Um, command lines have sort of like grown organically over time. Uh, different operating systems have different, um, have, have different uh, conventions. And as a result, uh, we ended up in, in this situation where there is no standard way of defining a command line. So I don't know if you've ever written a command line tool yourself or if you've used any, but you probably, when you get a brand new tool, you probably don't know how to use it, right? Because it's always different. Um, are they using forward slashes or hyphens like we do in, in Linux systems? Um, are we, is it command line, set? is it, sorry, is it case sensitive or not? Um, does the order matter? It's all sorts of things that is just all up to the developer on how to interpret that. And that causes some problems. So. The option characters, as, as you see on the slide, that's one of them, it's a very simple one. But what about text encoding? A lot of old tools only take ASCII encoding, whereas newer tools on Windows support Unicode. Um, as we will see later on, that causes problems uh, that attackers can benefit from. And as I was just saying as well, the command line structure, right? Um, how a command line is structured is always different. There is no standardization there. And that made it more difficult, especially in the slightly more early days of computing, because people were switching between operating systems and every system had their own conventions, every tool was different. So what some developers opted to do is to make these tools compatible with each other. So rather than, for instance, only supporting the forward slash, you could also support the hyphen or only supporting, I don't know, dash dash help. Why not also support forward slash question mark, right? So as a result, a lot of command line tools have many, many ways in which you can use them, but the output will be the exact same. So um, developers trying being helpful here, and I do appreciate from a, um, I suppose from a from a, um, a usability perspective, it's great, but from a uh, forensics perspective, it's horrible. And, and hopefully, in the next couple of examples on the next few slides, it will come a bit to life, uh, come come to life a bit more. So this phenomenon. Uh, of which I will be talking for the rest of the talk, is what I call synonymous command line arguments. So what do I mean by that? Is that you have two separate, completely different command lines, but the output will be the exact same because the tool sort of like under the hood tries to make them the same. Uh, and again, if, if, you're not, if you don't get what I mean, hopefully in the next couple of slides with the examples, it will come to life a bit more. But this is the problem I will be talking about. Command lines that are different, but do the exact same thing. And as we will see, that poses a big problem for detection, right? It, it allows attackers to write the, um, their command slightly different, meaning they can bypass detection mechanisms or uh, forensics processes and so on. Uh, and I will talk about solutions uh, as well at the end of this talk. Cool, so, so far the theory, Enet, let's now look at the juicy stuff, right? The, the really interesting stuff. So before I start um, uh, distinguishing the several types, what I've done in the last couple of months is looked at 40 built-in Microsoft executables, right? So you saw CertUtil, but I've also looked at PowerShell, I've looked at uh, discovery tools, all sorts of things. And I've analyzed them and tried to identify opportunities for obfuscating the command line in order to fool detection mechanisms. Um, I'll be releasing those results later today, um, so keep an eye on the Slack channel. But what I'll be talking about is the five different types of common obfuscation that I've identified. And hopefully, to me, some of these things were completely new, and hopefully to you, um, you will learn something about this as well. And it's really important to bear in mind. And later on, I will also show you how we can deal with this in, in life, because it is a, it's a difficult problem. So let's start with the first type of command line obfuscation I identified. Uh, it's a simple one. It's, we already talked about it briefly. It's what I call option character substitution. So basically, it is instead of using the normal option character, right, the sort of the prefix, um, use a different one. So if you look at the uh, screenshot here, it's very simple, right? Uh, this is a ping command. It says ping forward slash n, then a one, and then an IP address. So basically, this command line is saying ping this IP address with one packet. Um, if you ask the manual of ping, the, the help page, 
this is how the top one is how it asks you to do it. Use a forward slash and use an M. Um, however, if you start digging and you try a couple of different things, it turns out that this particular tool also supports the hyphen, right? So if you look at that second uh, part of the screenshot, you see that if I do dash N uh, one, uh, the outcome is the exact same. So this is what I mean with synonymous command lines, right? These two command lines are just factually different, but the outcome will always be the exact same because the tool under the hood turns the forward slash into a hyphen or vice versa. Um, what you'll see and what you see in my research as well is that mainly the Unix-like tools, so like who am I, are vulnerable to this, but there's a couple of other tools who do the exact same. Uh, and as I said, right, this is a really simple example. This is only one option character that's different, but what about this example, right? So this is the ARP tool that you can use to get information about the ARP table. Uh, lots of attackers like that for recon, right? For um, um, discovery phase of the attack. Um, it turns out that this particular tool supports eight different option characters, right? All weird Unicode characters. So if you look at the uh, table on the left, you see the normal slash, you see the normal hyphen, but also a longer hyphen, a dash, a division slide. Um, it turns out that if you try these characters, they are just accepted. So if you look at the screenshots here, um, that last one is like a really special hyphen. Uh, CMD can't even print it, right? So if you look closely, it's like a little question mark in CMD. But what I'm trying to say here is that if you have a rule looking for up with forward slash A, there are seven different ways of achieving the same thing. They will bypass that rule and you will still, an attacker will still get what they want, right? So this is very simple still, but you will see it gets more difficult once we uh, keep talking. Sweet, so I hope that made sense. Uh, now the next one is very similar. Um, instead of replacing the option character, we're now replacing the, uh, any other characters, right? So you saw on the previous slide, I used Unicode. What if I try replacing other characters with Unicode equivalents? So if you look at the screenshot here, you see the tool reg, right? That interacts with the Windows registry. Um, normally to make an export, you say reg export, uh, in this case, HKCU, and then the file where you want to output the uh, hive to. Um, However, if you look closely at the screenshot, you see that I've replaced the X of export and the R uh, with a Unicode equivalents. So th they look a bit like superscript, right? Like they're, they're tiny. Um, as it turns out, reg.exe is one of the tools that supports arbitrary Unicode replacement. So if you have a, uh, a random letter of the alphabet, there are a number of alternatives in Unicode ranges that are still supported. Um, and as you can see in the screenshot, it actually still works. I was quite surprised by that. Um, so again, you, you probably have heard about the whole serious SAM thing, right? And one attack angle is using reg for that. Um, if you use reg and you use exports and you, you have a rule that looks for that, this screenshot proves that it's really easy to bypass that rule by just changing some of the characters to Unicode equivalent. Um, so yeah, Unicode to the rescue once again. And yeah, as I said, like I've, I've tried 40 different Microsoft utilities, right? Uh, not all of them are vulnerable, but the ones that are often take substitutions from particular Unicode ranges. So um, the superscript ones that I just shown on the screen, those are from the spacing modifying letters range, but you know, some other ranges like Greek and uh, some Latin ranges with characters with crazy accents and uh, characters um, are also still supported. So sometimes there's like an infinite number of substitutions you can do and the rule or the, the uh, command line will still work. I thought it was pretty mind blowing as that for detection point of view makes it a lot harder, right? To detect the thing you're after. Sweet. Um, yeah, before I move on to the next one, this is a screenshot I saw on Twitter that really made me chuckle. It's from uh, Gregor Torek. Um, this is a different tool. I think this is not a built-in tool, but something from a Windows um, development kit. And he tried executing it with a special uh, dash there, a special hyphen, right? He, he highlighted it in red, uh, dash launch. Uh, when he tried that special hyphen, the tool actually warned him. It said like, hey, you, you, you gave a weird quote character or a weird dash character. And you know what, that's wrong, but I will still accept it anyway. Uh, you probably copied it from Microsoft Word, as it said here. Um, I thought this, this really illustrates the problem, right? This tool is trying to be helpful, trying to help the users like, oh, you did something wrong, but I will accept it anyway. Um, whereas to people like you and me, people in DFIR, this is horrible, right? Because um, this makes this allows an attacker to bypass your detections. So um, I thought it was a good example of the, the difference between how developers think and how people like you and I think. Right, okay, so we've had option character substitution and just arbitrary character substitution. 
How about insertion? So what about inserting special characters anywhere in the command line? So this is another example, different tool. So I've taken uh, WEVT util, it's a event log a utility. You're probably familiar with that. Um, what I was trying to do here is to show it the log information of the security log. So normally you say weft util GLI security. Uh, however, what I've tried here is just inserting character from characters from a special range. So these are Arabic characters. Um, and as you can see here, like CMD can't even print it. This again shows up as a question mark. But if you look in the notepad um, screen grab at the bottom, you see what the thing is now actually um, what I actually tried. And as you can also tell from the CMD execution, is it, it actually works. So even though it doesn't say GLI, but it says G character L character I, um, Weft Util just filters it out and just accepts, accepts the, the, the other thing. Um, again, not every executable is vulnerable to this, but again, there's, there's a substantial amount that just ignore specific ranges. Some of them um, filter out many, many ranges like Weft Util. There are also tools that just ignore a very small or narrow range. But still, for attackers, this allows them to uh, manipulate the command line and potentially bypass detection mechanisms. Um, and this includes both visible characters, like, like these ones, but sometimes invisible characters are supported as well, right? So characters that, um, if you print them, they just show as like a zero width character. Um, that makes detection even harder, right? So um, trouble here. Cool, so I, I hope you feel like where this is going, right? The type of obfuscation I'm talking about and the problem it poses. Um, this is another one that you might be familiar with. It's very common, it's a quote insertion. So this is a special subtype of character sub, uh, insertion in the sense that um, it has a requirement and that's basically that the quotes have to appear in an even number, right? They have to occur in pairs. Um, what I found in my research of those 30, 40 executables I investigated, I think, probably like 37 of them uh, were vulnerable to this. So if you look at the top one is NetSH, once again, a different tool, you see that it, I inserted two quotes. And as you can tell, it still told me what these um, Windows firewall status was. And on the second one as well, I inserted even more uh, quotes and it still accepted it, right? So just more quotes really obfuscating the real keywords that you would normally look for. Uh, and it just doesn't work. So yeah, as I said, this is really common. Most um, binaries are vulnerable to this uh, for a variety of reasons. But I do want to point out, because some of you might be thinking, OK, this guy is telling some interesting stuff, but I've heard about this before, right? Um, Daniel Bohannon has done some excellent research on what he calls dosfuscation, which is in a, in a way very similar to this. But I do want to point out this is something different from dosfuscation. Dosfuscation is only about commands, uh, the command prompt, right? CMD.exe, maybe a little bit of PowerShell. But what I'd like to point out is that everything I'm presenting today doesn't rely on CMD. So I know all the screenshots are taken from CMD, but if you execute the same thing with say Python or even with a custom malware binary, this would all still work. If you open this in Procmon or Proc Explorer, you would actually see those quotes there or you would actually see those Unicode characters there. And to demonstrate that, I have a counter example here of the quotes thing. Um, the, the third command line there is Wimic, right? The, WMI uh, command tool. Um, I tried to insert quotes there, but as you can see, even in CMD, it says like, okay, great, you, you gave me two quotes, but I don't know what to do with that. So I'm not gonna do what you asked me to do. So Wimic is actually one of the very rare executables that is not vulnerable to this type of obfuscation. And uh, Wimic is actually quite strict. So of all the executables I tested, I think Wimic is the only one that wasn't vulnerable to any of these four types, or five types rather. Um, yeah, so I do want to point that out. This is, this is an extension of dosfuscation. It goes beyond just um, CMD. Let me see if I can move it forward. There we go. Cool. So the, fi the final one, um, shorthands. So you might be familiar with this. If you've ever used PowerShell, you know there is an option that's called encoded command, which allows you to pass base64 encoded content, and uh, PowerShell will execute it for you. Um, so as you can see at the top one, I say PowerShell forward slash encoded command, and then some base 64 stuff. Um, as it turns out, if you leave out the last character, it will still work. If it turns out you remove two of the last characters, it will still work. All the way down to only one character slash E will also still work. So um, you can't just say 
or you, you don't just have to say slash encoded command. You can also say slash encoded command or slash encoded comma all the way down to slash e. Um, to some degree, this is what you see in, in Linux world as well, right? Where you often have like a, a short version like dash i instead of dash dash ignore. Um, but I think this is just, if, if I'm, in my humble opinion, this is just taking it one step too far, right? I don't think anyone is really benefiting from having, what was it like 12 different options for the same command? Um, I don't think slash encoded co is more clear than slash e and c, for example, right? So um, I think this is just a, a poor design choice. Uh, some people might benefit from it, but I think the sort of disadvantage for people like you and me is far bigger than the advantage for people who, uh, who might be relying on this. Um, cool. Before I start talking about um, the, the sort of like the tools I've used for this and, and uh, how, how to prevent this from happening or like how, how to make sure you catch this in your own environments, uh, a special mention for these three binaries. So we got MS lookup on the screenshot. This is a special type of shorthand that is, I think, far worse than the PowerShell one. Um, so NSLOOKUP is a tool for doing DNS queries, right? So the top one is an NSLOOKUP query uh, asking for the TXT record of example.org. Again, an attacker might use this for, I don't know, command and control means. Um, just like PowerShell, instead of slash type, you can also say slash TY, right? So you just leave out the last two characters and it turns out it still works. So far, nothing new. Uh, however, it then turns out that if you add other random characters, it still works, right? So the third um, command line there is nslookup dash typhoon equals txt. And as you can tell, the command line still works. My mind was pretty blown by this. So what is happening here is that this tool only looks at the first two characters, ignores everything after it, and then only when there is an equal sign, it starts paying attention again. So for that reason, the fourth, um, the, the, the fourth command line there, it says, thank you for attending this presentation equals TXT. Uh, and it still works. So yeah, I, I think this is by far the worst type of um, command line design I've seen. And again, not only can you fool detection mechanisms, but you can also fool analysts, right? Into thinking that it's not looking for type, but it's looking for typhoons. I don't know, something that starts with TY. Um, so NSLOOKUP is vulnerable to this, but regsurf 32 is not an example there. CMD key, that's the same. So again, tools that you might see an attacker use um, appear to be have like this sort of wild card uh, command line options, which is um, not great for people like you and me. So, okay, now we've had the five types. So you might be thinking, how big is this problem then? Um, I've, I keep talking about these 40 binaries, but what, what does this mean? So. Later today, uh, when the US has woken up, I will be releasing uh, the results of, of my findings. So uh, it will look a little bit like this. This is a screen grab. Um, it's basically a list of executables that I tested and the five different types that I've just identified. So for example, if we look at say certain util, because we looked at that earlier today, um, the table now tells me that there are five different option characters you can use on top of the uh, existing one. Um, there's six characters that you apparently can uh, insert in random places and it still accepts the command. Um, it turns out it is vulnerable to character substitution. So there are ranges um, that you can substitute the uh, letters from and it will still work. Quote insertion works, as you can tell, that is this very popular one. And um, cert util is not vulnerable to shorthand, um, and, and any sort of shorthand, but as you can tell, some other binaries are like uh, at or a CACLS. So um, now that poses a question, right? Um, because how, what, what are we going to do about that? So I'll be talking about it on the next few slides. But, but before I continue, um, just for you, because I think are we doing time wise? 10 minutes left. So um, I've written a tool for this uh, to investigate these 40 binaries, right? So I've already investigated 40 for you. I will be releasing those results. But the tool itself is something I'm going to open source as well. And that means that you can uh, test even more executables, but also means you can test your own executables, right? Maybe you're relying on some special tools in your environment and you want to test, are they vulnerable to this type of command line obfuscation? Um, it's a bit like, it, it just, it's, it's almost brute forcing it. It's just trying all the different variations and sees if the results are the same. It's highly configurable. So I'll be releasing that later today on GitHub. So keep an eye on the Slack channel so you can uh, check it out and um, hopefully you can contribute as well, because I hope this can really be a community um, project. Cool, okay, um, enough about that. So the last 10 minutes, 
So what can we do about it, right? I've identified a problem. Um, what does that mean? So detection is hard. We all know that. And whether you're a threat hunter or doing like a forensics and incident response, um, it's, 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 it's a hard problem, right? Like how do you detect something efficiently? So to illustrate the problem, I've taken this example from uh, the Sigma repository. Um, you might be familiar with Sigma. It's the open source uh, SIEM format slash tool set. Uh, really helpful in, in detecting badness, all sorts of um, uh, malicious stuff. Uh, I've deliberately picked a very simple one um, just to keep it, keep, it, keep it straightforward for this presentation. If you look at the, um, the screen grab at the bottom, um, what this rule is looking for, it's looking for executions of CMD key.exe and a command line that contains space forward slash list space. Um, so somehow, I, th I think it says here, right? So it says this is relevant because an attacker might use this for looking for cached credentials. So if this happens, it might be of interest. It's a very straightforward one, but with the knowledge of what I've presented before, we now know that this can well, quite easily be bypassed. Um, from my research, it, for instance, shows that the forward slash can be replaced with a hyphen. If an attacker does that, this rule would never fire and it would go unnoticed, right? Uh, similarly, we know CMD key can be shortened, so slash L or slash LI would also work. Um, on top of that, the, the slide I was just showing with the crazy wildcard um, command line arguments, CMD key was one of those three, right? So not even slash list is supported, but slash law, 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 law would also be supported. It would still work, but this rule wouldn't fire. Um, and you can also combine these three things together, right? So what if I change both the option character and shorten the command to slash L, right? So if I do hyphen L, uh, it would still work. So there's a number of permutations there and uh, this rule wouldn't work. So you might be thinking, okay, great, this guy, this guy keeps rambling on about command line stuff and everything that's wrong, but how can we make this right? So uh, don't worry, uh, I'm gonna talk about that right now. So to get resilient and robust um, detections, um, I've got five suggestions, five tips that I think are really beneficial. And some of you might be already doing them. Some of them might only do some of them. Um, either way, it's a good reminder and um, let, let's crack on. So the first one, my first suggestion would be try to keep the rule as broad as possible, right? So don't try, if you can, try to avoid hard coding forward slashes and hyphens in your detection logic, because as we can see, it's easy quite often to replace them and it would still work. So um, as an example here, search util, and if you look for slash split, um, instead of that, just look for search util with the keyword split, right? Um, that at least makes sure that if there is option character substitution, your detection would still work. Uh, there's always a trade-off there between false positives and true positives, so you can't always do this, but this already in itself might, might help, right? Make it as broad as you can, and um, in this, this example would, would already be beneficial. Second one, which if you can, I would really recommend is normalizing your outputs, right? So keep the original command line, but also perhaps create a separate field where the same command line is deobfuscated. So um, if you look at the example, right? This is a working command line for cert util. If you pass this, it would actually work. Special dash, random Arabic characters, um, replaced Unicode characters, it would still work. But what you wanna see as an analyst uh, and also for your detection logic is that bottom one, right? Just dash URL cache. So it turns out that even in Python, um, with, a, with a simple one-liner, you can turn that top one into the bottom one, right? You just import a special module, um, you run it over it, and you get something that is way easier to understand. So um, what I would recommend is if you can, like get a separate field, uh, run your detection logic against that as well. And even if someone tries to obfuscate it, your normalized column might still get hits on the, on the alerting, right? So um, get rid of Unicode if you can, get rid of quotes, maybe even tokenize uh, and see if that, that really helps. So normalize your outputs is a really big one. Right, um, related to this, um, try to detect the obfuscation itself, right? Especially if you have this special column, if you compare this normalized column with the original column, uh, perhaps they are so different that that in itself is worth an alert, right? It's really trying someone trying really hard to to hide something. So um, that would be one way of doing it. You can also just look for outliers, right? Maybe your um, in your environment, reg or XD executions for, basically never have Unicode characters. So maybe that's a way of just you know if it has a Unicode character, that in itself is an anomaly. So um, that's one. 
character density. There's a number of ways there. Use data analytics in a clever way, and you might be able to detect the obfuscation itself. Cool. And then this, I think, is a really key one. Uh, and I know some of you are already doing this, but again, just a reminder, instead of looking for the command line, try, if you can, to look for artifacts instead. Right. So in this example here, instead of looking for uh, the event log utility being executed with the CL for clear log um, command line, it's way better to look for event logs that have the ID 1102, which means event log cleared. Um, because we know the command line can be obfuscated. We even know from other research it can be completely spoofed, right? Your EDR or forensic solution can be completely fooled, um, whereas artifacts are a lot harder to um, spoof. So if you can look for a file creation or a registry event or some network connection instead, please try and write rules on that and not on the command line, because the command line can be very easily fooled. Um, so this is a really key one, I think. Right, and then the, the last one before we um, wrap up. Um, it's not so much as a tip, it's maybe more a conclusion, is that we've seen today, there's lots of ways in which you can bypass common detection and forensic uh, instruments. But just a reminder that you won't be able to detect everything, right? You won't be able to detect all the malicious stuff all the time. However, the more you do to try and detect it, the harder it will be for an attacker to go completely unnoticed, right? So I really hope that what I've shown today and the stuff I will be releasing later today that that really helps um, set another step in the right direction of being able to detect uh, malicious stuff going on on your environment. Well, thank you very much for, um, for your attention. I really hope this, this helped you. Um, as I said, keep an eye on the Slack channel and um, really looking forward to your feedback as well on this. So please let me know. And um, that was it. Thank you very much. Oh, Vita, from, from my side, that was... <laughs> Oh wow! I mean, that that was really, really some exceptional research. And just looking at the at uh, your hallway in the Slack channel, it's it's buzzing with activity, uh, which I'm sure you'll you'll get to afterwards. Um, you know, obviously, you know, those of us that are doing digital forensics work, you know, we we encounter obfuscation a lot. You know, as I mentioned, we often see it with with PowerShell, and and see what you've been picking up at the command line level is actually a little bit scary. Um, you know, I, we we're gonna have to go back, I think, and look at some of our SATS courses in terms of how we look at uh, obfuscation. This, but but really, really, really exceptional presentation, some really amazing research. Um, uh, I, I can't commend you enough for for the amount of effort and time that you would have had to put into to actually figure all of this out. So so absolute kudos from. Uh, from my side. Um, looking at the question panel, um, I don't see any questions currently in the QA. Um, uh, not so many questions so far in, in terms of, um, of, of um, uh, your hallway. Lots of compliments. You, you, you're getting like a huge amount of compliments, which is which is brilliant. Um, but just maybe a question from from my side. So so obviously you've looked at, at the sort of um, you know your your sort of traditional Windows command line binaries, your typical living off the land kind of um, things. Do you think that we might find similar you know similar issues um, you know in terms of this command line obfuscation within within Linux as well? I know there are some examples that you've you've mentioned, but do you think we might see a similar level of vulnerability within Linux as you picked up within the Windows environment? I think I think it's an excellent question, and uh, the good news is is that the the tool we'll be releasing actually also works on Linux. So I've tried it a little bit, um, but I can say it is less prevalent on Linux systems. There is a bit more, surprisingly enough, there's a bit more standardization there. So, for instance, you would never see say a forward slash on Linux, right? That's really rare. Uh, it's usually hyphens, double hyphens. It's a bit more standardized, but you're absolutely right. I think the problem is everywhere, and it's just it's just an inherent problem, right? Because we we don't force these rules on developers. It's just to their discretion, how they implement it. And uh, some people uh, or some developers, like again, with usability in mind, really trying to help, it just makes it for us really hard, right? Because it's um, it's just very easy to uh, to fool it and bypass detection. So no, you're right. I think, uh, and maybe people will use this research to also demonstrate it's the same in Linux and Mac environments, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Or even beyond that in other operating systems. I, I do believe that's that's definitely the case. So um, really looking forward, if someone else picks this up as research, will be will be great to hear. Yeah, I, I I have a number of friends of mine who who are, who are developers, because we all have friends in different areas of IT, 
And uh, you know, I, I just look at I just look at some of the discussions we've had over the years. You know, things around input validation and, and things along those lines. And I think you know this this kind of talks to this as well. You know, how we write code is is uh, is problematic. Uh, absolutely. So again, it's not. It's also I'm really apologetic for having to point to all the problems. And there's not there's not an easy solution to this, right? But um, the least we can do as you know defenders and investigators to uh, to be aware of it and, and do something about it. But you're right. I think if there is a deaf conference somewhere else going on, I really hope someone addresses this point as well because it's uh, it, it's a big problem. And I think as you see, some tools are so crazy with the number of different permutations that it's just, mm -hmm. it makes it basically impossible to reliably detect. So I really hope that going forward, more things are designed with security in mind, right? So yes, also some of the tools yeah. I was talking about today are, are developed like decades ago. So security exactly, wasn't yeah. as hot a topic then. So um, let's see if it gets <laughs> exactly. um, Yeah, this is, I mean, just, just from sort of a closing point, uh, once again, guys, please uh, complete the evals for, for Witzer's research. I, I, I honestly, cannot wait to to see your research uh, published later bit so i'm going to be watching your github repository with with a lot of uh, a lot of glee and, and attention um i think you got i think you're going to get a lot of uh, really really positive feedback in terms of what you've picked up and and as you said you know as defenders we've sometimes got to figure out what's wrong because you know the, the reality is the enemies that we sort of uh, you know we're dealing with we we often we often get accused as defenders of being too reactionary you know we we wait for something bad to happen and then we try and figure out how it is and i think what you've done is kind of identify some areas that we should actually be more sensitive to in our investigations for those attack groups out there who who may actually already be doing this and we haven't been looking at it because it's you know, maybe a bit niche or, or we don't know about it yet. So you've been sort of shining a, a light on a dark place, um, which I think is really what we what we want from, you know, from any sort of uh, forensic investigation, which is absolutely brilliant. So, yeah, so, so Vitsa, from, from my side, um, you know, on behalf of SADS, I just want to say thank you very much for an amazing presentation. Um, I, I'm, I'm sort of going to be keeping my eye on your hallway channel while I'm listening to the next presentation, you know, from, from Evangelos as well because it's Super. really, really interesting. Um, but yeah, so from my side, I'd just like to say absolutely thank you, thank you, thank you very much. A really amazing presentation. And uh, uh, I look forward to to um, catching up with you at some point in the future. So, so awesome, well done. Absolutely, thank you for the kind words and thank you for having me here today. It's really, really, really pressure. And uh, also looking forward to, to hearing from you community on, on the research and also seeing contribute to that. Uh, will be amazing so thank you so much for giving me the opportunity it's really a really a great experience brilliant brilliant, brilliant. no that's perfect thanks thanks very much Vitsa.